Welcome, everybody. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I am pleased to welcome you to today's virtual meetup on the topic of the impact of COVID-19 on day schools. This is a third part of a series that we are hosting to help funders better understand the impact and the needs of day schools during this time. And we are really grateful for the partnership with Prisma, who has helped us put all this wonderful content together. And so a little bit of background is that with the conclusion of of this school year, Jewish day schools and yeshivas are refocusing their attention on the coming year and the financial challenges that have arisen in light of COVID-19. And today we have a panel of funders that can identify the needs day schools are facing and how they are being addressed on a local, regional, and North American level, and to help ensure that the Jewish educational providers can open their doors physically or virtually this fall. And to start us off today, I'm pleased to um, introduce Paul Bernstein, the CEO of Prisma, to, to get us started today. Thank you, Paul. I am Paul Bernstein. I'm the CEO of Prisma. I apologize about that. Um, and uh, delighted to add my words of welcome to everyone to be part of this conversation. And also a big thank you to the Jewish Funders Network and to you, Tamar, for partnering with us to enable these conversations about key issues that are facing Jewish day schools. Um, what I recommend everyone does, uh, we have a, a number of speakers who I'll introduce in a couple of minutes. What I recommend you do is use the speaker view in order to see who's speaking. That's at the top right of your Zoom screen for anyone who's unfamiliar. I would suggest staying on mute when you're not speaking. Um, feel free to use the chat at any point if you have questions, comments, want to chat with other people on the call. Uh, we encourage it. It's a great way to connect with people who care about issues that are all dear to us. So please do that. So what we'll do is uh, I, I'm uh, going to introduce the speakers, then I'll do a brief introduction to a couple of the issues. After that, uh, our speakers will present for a few minutes each, and then we're going to open up to discussion and questions. So please do, as I said, feel free to share your questions or your comments in the chat or to prepare them for when we have discussion later on. It's my pleasure first to introduce the speakers we're going to hear from today. Um, first will be Anne Parva, who is the immediate past chair of Prisma and also Prisma's development chair. Pr Anne is a deeply committed philanthropist in the day school world and in many other areas from West Hartford in Connecticut. She founded uh, Jewish High School in West Hartford and more recently has led the merger of that high school with another local school. And coming out of that merger, uh, Anne and her husband, Jeremy, created a very innovative tuition program that was set up pre-COVID, but is incredibly relevant to others, we think, um, as we think about ways to really best address the needs of schools going forward. And Anne is going to share that with us today. Anne, thank you for being with us. Second, I'm delighted to introduce Connie Cantor and Melissa Rivkin. Connie is the CEO. Melissa is the Director of Day School Strategy for the Samis Foundation in Seattle. Um, Samis is a long time, deep, incredible supporter of Jewish day schools and more generally Jewish education in Seattle. Both Connie and Melissa have a long background in the schools and in Jewish education themselves before they joined Samis. And Connie herself is both professional and previously a lay leader of the Samis Foundation and they're going to share with us some of the work that's going on in Seattle itself. And then third, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Felicia Herman, who is the executive director of the Natan Fund. Natan inspires young philanthropists in collaborative giving in Israel and Jewish communities around the world. Today, Felicia is with us because she's currently working with the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund, leading their aligned grant program which is incredibly important to all of us in addressing both the emergency needs that have arisen from the current crisis and some of the emergent systemic issues that are, that are coming from it. And Felicia is with us to share some of what they are thinking about and what they are learning that may inform others. So as you can see, we have a great group of speakers who bring different perspectives on the financial, uh, on the financial issues and how philanthropists themselves can make a difference. Before I turn over to our first speaker, just a few words of context of what's happening. Um, 
Prisma is the network for Jewish day schools and we've been working very closely with more than 300 schools throughout the crisis and since it began in early March. As we come to the end of the school year that now is, uh, uh, is with us, I think that we can all be incredibly proud of the achievement at each and every one of the schools that we work with, the way in which they have led in providing a truly rich virtual teaching and learning environment, the way that they have supported their students, their families and their faculty, and the way that they've really conducted themselves as communities for example, if you, ha if you haven't seen, I would go and find videos that are out there of graduations that have gone on in recent weeks, which have just been examples of the truly extraordinary and innovative ways that the schools have uh, engaged with their students through this crisis. So we are incredibly grateful to the educators, administrators, lay leaders and supporters of each of the schools we have the, pl the pleasure to, to work with. As we look ahead towards the next school year, of course, there are tremendous challenges. And today we are going to focus on the financial challenges, but I want to recognize that every school right now is deep in scenario planning for how they, they will reopen and what the different possibilities are when it comes to the new school year. Each of them is determined to offer the best possible education and to be able to adapt to whatever uncertainty and whatever changes are necessary in the year ahead. As we focus on the financial aspects, there are many challenges that schools are really trying to work through. These cover things like enrollment and re-enrollment as families are looking at how to handle the uncertainty of the year ahead. It covers the need for tuition assistance, um, uh, in many aspects which have been exacerbated in the crisis and as PRISMA we have been proud to partner with the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund to offer additional tuition, tuition assistance to schools that have the greatest increase in, in assistance needs as well as to address the needs of Jewish communal professionals who may have been furloughed or lost their jobs through the crisis. But we will hear more about tuition assistance opportunities and some of the structural issues that people may want to address. address. The schools are having to think about how to invest in reopening and the technology issues and the professional development that will make next school year happen. Schools are having to think about their fundraising needs in times when donors themselves have challenges and fundraising is generally under pressure. And lastly, schools are thinking about opportunities to innovate. What investments do we need to enable our schools to be as successful as they possibly can in the year ahead and as successful as they possibly can for the long term. It's these issues that we're going to address today. And so first, I am proud to introduce Anne Parva, who is going to talk about some of her experiences, both nationally and in, in particular in West Hartford. Anne, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here today my, uh, to speak with all of you about uh, the tuition initiative that we started here um, last fall in our newly merged modern orthodox pre-k through 12 school in West Hartford, Connecticut. But what makes me most excited about speaking is these Zooms is seeing friends from like all over the country that I don't normally get to see. So I'm just going to say flat out hello and I'm so happy to see you today. Um, before I speak about uh, about the impact of the tuition initiative during the COVID world and what we see for next year, I would like to just take a minute and speak a little bit about um, the tuition initiative. We launched it last fall, was the first time that it was available to people, this, just this past fall in 2019. And I think we have to sort of talk about that a little bit to understand how it's working now. So um, I just wanted to say that my husband Jeremy and I worked with Prisma um, and Prisma's tuition incentive guru, if anybody is thinking about doing this, Dan Perla, and we studied other tuition programs across the United States, really across uh, North America, um, to help us come up with the plan. And we really wanted to come up with numbers that would make a difference. And so I, I've actually asked Hana, our uh, uh, development director from Prisma, to just post for a minute um, what our tuition program is so people can see it, see what it is. So 
So that is, um, that's the cost of uh, attending uh, the New England Jewish Academy, a brand new um, merged school. Um, okay, so Hannah, I'm going to ask you to take it down because of course I can never figure out how to get back to where I was before. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that, that initiative uh, I think was probably the largest um, subsidized initiative across the country um, that at least that we know of. We marketed it, of course, through our local school, our federation, and in partnership with the, the local Orthodox synagogues because it is an Orthodox school. Um, and we set up a booth at the OU fair uh, for the school. And I just, just so that people know, just from being at that OU fair, we had 80 inquiries. Um, people who were interested in, in uh, this tuition incentive, and 26 uh, families who actually called the school to set up tours from like all over the country and to visit the community. And in fact, before COVID hit, um, 11 families had actually um, come to visit the community uh, and toured the school and toured the community. And three of them in March moved to uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, the other 15 families who, um, the, the uh, other 15 families said to us, well, I'll get into the other 15 families. I would say that um, pre-COVID, that's how that affected there. Um, and, um, and then once COVID hit, we, we didn't see too much activity from outside of the area. Um, locally, in truthfulness, uh, in the beginning, we did not see a huge increase in enrollment um, last September locally, uh, mainly because uh, the cost of tuition for families who weren't coming locally really wasn't the only factor for them not coming, right? And so uh, we were merging, we were in the process of merging, we didn't have a head of school, we didn't have the new building. There were so many things up in the air. But what I will say is that with the tuition incentive for the families who were in the school, we did get a few new families in, but for the most part, we saw 100% um, re-enrollment for the next year uh, from families who were already in the school. Um, they were ecstatic to be able to have a day school tuition go down significantly, and there was just a happiness in the school, and it was palpable. At the same time, which is important to note when we talk about post-COVID, we, we not only launched the new, issue, the, the new tuition incentive initiative, but we launched a, um, a campaign for excellence among the families. And we did both at the same time where we asked families if they could, if they were able to, to um, contribute back all or at least part of, um, of what they were saving with the tuition incentive and that they could choose, the families actually decided on where that money would go. And there were four pots of, um, of places where they thought the school could do better and they wanted to uh, invest in like the resource room and a couple of other places I can't think off the top of my head. And that actually was um, very successful in, at the opening of school, uh, we raised about $80,000 uh, in funds uh, from current families. So, um, so that was pre-COVID. I would say that post-COVID, um, so we had the local and we have the people who are thinking of coming from out of town. As I mentioned, um, that the call stopped coming after uh, COVID hit and and the other 15 families who had contacted us basically said, we're gonna consider you for next year, but we just don't see ourselves being able to move. And, um, and then I will tell you that last week, now that life is lightening up a little bit, um, we've begun to get lots of phone calls again. And in fact, we've just, I just learned the school knew this, um, uh, three new families are moving, uh, three more families of those original 11 are, are moving and more people are trying to schedule time to come and, and tour the school. So I would say that um, there were two things coupled with this new rush of people looking at us. And I would say one is of course, 
uh, the cost of tuition. People are attracted from out of town for that, but um, we're also hearing from people that they're, they're looking to get out of the New York area. I think this has been a very traumatic time um, for people in those areas, and so they're looking for other opportunities to, to move. Um, I think that um, the low cost of tuition actually had a tremendous impact once COVID hit. And much of this is anecdotal, but I'm gonna share with you what we saw. Um, families were already, for the most part, feeling very grateful for the lowered um, cost of tuition. Uh, not a single family asked for a tuition refund once we went to virtual learning, which I have heard happen in other schools. Um, so far, no one who receives the tu who receives the tuition incentive. So, by the way, not everybody. There were people on scholarship who already were paying less than what we were offering for the tuition incentive. So they're not in these numbers, but everyone who receives the tuition incentive, not not a soul, has asked for more scholarship for next year. And um, but what they have said, we've heard from two or three families already that they already know that they would not be able to give into the general, the campaign for excellence uh, this year, that they wouldn't be able to afford that because of COVID, which um, says to me that had we not had this tuition assistance program or incentive program, that they, this, these families might have been asking for more tuition um, help, but they, they didn't need to, but they're not going to be making the donation. Um, or as much of a donation, families where we are not seeing, um, where we're seeing some questioning um, is from families in preschool. I think preschools have been very difficult um, for, for the Zoom and people are questioning, is it even worth paying for preschool tuition? And also kindergarten and first grader families are also calling and our director of admissions says that the conversation that they're able to have because tuition is $5,000 for kindergarten and first grade um, has been extremely helpful in reminding families about the benefit they're getting from keeping their children in the school at this time. Um, so it looks like um, everyone in our school who's there now, aside from the families who are moving, we have a couple families moving and a couple of families who always send their children to um, Yeshiva High School. Uh, we have a couple of uh, Chabad families in the school always take their children out for high school and send them to Chabad schools. Aside from that, everyone else is re-enrolling. And, um, and we also know that as of today, we have an increase of eight students uh, for next year in our entire student body. And it, possible that it'll go up to 12 according to the admissions director that I spoke with this morning. So I would say that um, I would say that the tuition incentive program uh, helped the school remain somewhat healthier uh, during um, during COVID. It is um, and it's preparing the school for staying healthy uh, is helping the school to stay healthy in the fall. And that's it. Thank you, Anne, and it's great to see the tangible, tangible results of the initiative that you, that you and Jeremy have taken. So thank you very much for that. Next, I'm going to hand over to Connie and Melissa from the Samus Foundation to talk to us about their work in Seattle. Connie, over to you. Thanks so much, Paul. I appreciate it. Um, I'm the CEO of the Samus Foundation. I've been in this role for about a year. I had been a board member for uh, over eight years prior to that. Samus's focus uh, in its fund philanthropy in the U.S. is intensive, immersive Jewish education. And given that focus, it's no surprise that day schools are our highest priority far and away uh, in all of our philanthropy. Um, we've been around for about 25 years, and we're going to hit $100 million in philanthropy this year. Nearly $90 million of that $100 million has been directed to the day schools of Seattle. Um, we're supporting seven day schools in Seattle across all denominations. We're a little different than some foundations in that regard, that we are supporting the, the breadth of day schools in Seattle. Um, at this point, Sambas represents 30% of the budgets for our local day schools. And with about 450 students this year, uh, that comes up to be about $10,000 per student. 
Um, I wish I could say with that that we had a lot more than 450 students and that um, with the level of philanthropy we're offering uh, on a per student basis, that it led to significantly reduced tuition costs. Unfortunately, the small size of our schools, which uh, none of which are, are more than about 150 students, uh, means that we um, still have quite a burden for our families to bear in terms of making the decision for Jewish Day School. Um, but we know that it is by far and away the most impactful uh, Jewish educational experience that can be offered and therefore our commitment. So I wanna just talk a little bit about COVID and, and what we did overall. And then I'm gonna pass over to Melissa Rifkin, who's our Director of Day School Strategy, to talk specifically about our technology initiative, uh, which is now in its eighth year and of course took on new meaning with COVID. Um, if I were to think about the key things that were really important for us at SAMUS, when we, when we looked at the situation coming forward, and I'll mention our revenue all comes from commercial real estate, much of which is retail and, and restaurant. So we are working through the revenue side of things as well at SAMUS. But on our philanthropy side, we knew that our schools and some of our other grantees, particularly camps, would have great needs. And so we started talking right away with our heads of school. And I think communication really was key. Um, we took the lead of some of the large national funders who sent out sort of a letter that was published in E-Jewish Philanthropy, letting their grantees know that they were there for them, that they were gonna be more flexible, um, really uh, adjust their expectations appropriately given the, co the coronavirus. Um, and we did something similar at SAMUS, and I think that went a long way with our grantees. But more important, it was really just picking up the phone and calling our heads. So between Melissa and myself, there hasn't been a week that's gone by without us having a personal conversation with every single one of the heads of school, of the seven schools that we support in Seattle. Um, knowing that we're there for them, knowing they can vent to us sometimes, they don't have a lot of peer support always, um, has been really important. It's also been a chance to communicate just updates about what's going on with PPP. All of our schools applied for and received PPP loans. Um, in total, $1.8 million came into the Seattle system through that phenomenal um, federal program. So communications included really just directing our schools towards help and guidance where they could. Another role that we really, I think, have been playing that's an important one now is that convening role. And in terms of convening, it's convening our heads of school, which we normally do monthly um, on a regular basis, but also our technology cohort that I think Melissa can talk a little more about. The last thing I'll mention that we've really tried to keep an eye on is flexibility. And um, that's in all things. And sometimes it's like we adjusted deadlines for when certain grant requests would be coming in for us. Instead of coming in May, we said, bring them in July. And then one head of school reached out and said, you know, I'm filling this out. And I realized I'm going to want to want one set of funding if we're live and a different set if we're all hybrid and another one if we're completely online. And how do I deal with that? And so we just had to call an audible at the moment and send out an update to our heads and say, let's talk about how you can make these requests so that we'll be able to respond whatever your needs are. And also let them know that we'd have funding available throughout the year as we move forward. So what are the big areas that we see the needs in? I think Paul really addressed, addressed them at the front. Scholarship needs, right now Samus is funding full need for scholarships for all of the seven Seattle schools. They all use the FASPA or FAST system. Um, we're also, we're seeing that that need will likely go up. So far it hasn't, so far it's been surprisingly few appeals, but we think most people are really waiting with all the uncertainty. Um, the second area of course will be enrollment. Um, a third area is gonna be if they are reopening, what does that mean in terms of distancing guidelines, in terms of staffing requirements, if they have to break classes into separate rooms, um, what does it mean for them in terms of additional expenses for that? Or of course, all of the cleaning supplies and masks and the like. But I think one of the most important things, and I'll, I'll chalk this up to um, a visionary trustee who had one vision for this program that transformed into something completely different. But our technology initiative, which Melissa is going to talk about, has really been invaluable uh, in these Corona days. So I'll pass it to you, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about the technology initiatives. So it started about um, eight years ago and it started with the vision of one trustee who really felt that all of the day schools should, know, should teach coding. 
And as you know, every school has a different, you know, different capacity and different educational model. And um, in the early days, uh, we would often say, you know, we're going to give you this grant to teach coding. We're going to give you, you know, get money for smart boards or document cameras and so forth. And very quickly, we realized that uh, we needed to listen to our grantees because a lot of times they didn't have the capacity to spend the money that we were willing to give them or they didn't see it as a priority. Um, so that was a big that was a big takeaway uh, many years ago. And since then, we've been convening a technology cohort of representatives from each school for going on maybe for the last eight years. And they meet monthly. Um, during COVID, they meet twice a month. So th they've been really like the superheroes of the COVID um, crisis. Um, and, but um, you know, sharing ideas among the schools, we find we have two high schools, uh, rest of elementary schools. Um, so different, different needs. One school can go up to fifth, fifth grade. So when we started these convenings and listening to what our schools needed, it became clear um, that uh, that was that was the way the way to go. Um, and we had to become flexible and adjust our expectations as well. During COVID, so when the crisis hit, um, all of our schools, I think all of our schools were ready to go online even before our governor um, enforced this order. And they were, um, you know, quickly pivoted and... Did we just completely lose uh, Melissa? I think we did. Uh, um, we, they did quickly did. pivot. Um, they moved into online education actually before even the government order here in Seattle. And so um, only one of the seven schools uh, actually waited to close down when the government order came through. Um, otherwise, all of them had already gone to uh, online yeah. prior to that. Um, and in terms of working together, there's Melissa, I'll let her pick right back up. Okay, so sorry about that. I did have some computer issues this morning and I'm using my husband's uh, computer. Um, so where was I? So COVID hit and our schools were ready to quickly pivot and go, go online. Um, we immediately um, went to the grants committee and they authorized emergency technology grants for um, the schools up to $10,000. Although since then we've, we've given more uh, to some schools when they've come back with um, with great greater need. So as Connie said, we're in touch with our heads of schools on a weekly basis and certainly uh, before the crisis, but during the crisis and things that we expected that they would need uh, the emergency tech grants for, sometimes they were realized and sometimes they were totally, you know, d different needs that we hadn't um, anticipated. And um, I guess, I guess the, the, my big takeaway here is communicating with your grantees. We communicate a lot and really adjusting our expectations because we're not the ones delivering the education in the schools they are. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Melissa. And now I'm going to hand over to Felicia Herman to talk about the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund. Hi, everybody. I'm also having connectivity issues, as I warned Paul and Tamar. So you'll just let me know over chat or kick me off or something if it gets too bad. Um, so I'm really happy to be with you all here today um, to tell you a little bit about the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund, mostly because I think it is a model that, um, that philanthropy should be looking at as a model to emulate. Um, I think uh, one of the things that happened with uh, JCRIF, as we call it, when it um, emerged is that everybody, I think a lot of people looked at it and said, oh great, this is a solution to all of our problems. And, and actually it's just meant as a, as a temporary, you know, unique sort of response by a handful of funders um, to really try to look at the broad scale needs of different Jewish communal sectors, including the day sector and to try to come up with an immediate response to the crises that different sectors are seeing. And if there's one message that I want to convey really explicitly right here is that it is a, it's a terrific model of collaboration and innovation and really a, a visionary philanthropic model that I hope will be plagiarized and replicated by many funders um, within sectors, within geographies, um, really to uh, understand that this model of coming together as funders allows you to have so much more impact 
than any particular funder could have on their own. And it would be amazing to see some sort of, you know, um, copy of JCRIP emerge just within the day school field itself. Um, I think I saw Paul nod. My connection is good enough to see Paul, you know, um, nod across the, across the ether. So let me just give you a little bit of um, background. So JCRIP was created really in the very beginning days of the crisis. The Maimonides Foundation, the Schusterman Foundation, the Jim Joseph Foundation, the Singer Foundation um, came together on the grant side. JCRIF is actually two pools of funding, um, one for no interest loans um, that day schools are definitely eligible to apply for and that Prisma has been excellent um, in terms of being an intermediary for day schools to apply for the no interest loans. Um, there's a loan fund and then there's the grant fund. And uh, on the grant side, um, we have uh, Singer Schusterman, Maimonides, um, uh, Jim Joseph, and the Aviv Foundation. Each of those funders um, participates in what we're calling an aligned grant program, which means that each of them is making their own independent decisions. And some of the grants that have come through um, to JCRIF have been things that, you know, one, two, three, four, or five funders have participated in. The day school one was very easy for everyone to say yes to. Day schools, um, were so obviously a cornerstone of the Jewish communal infrastructure and so obviously in need of a certain kind of emergency financing that might look a little different from the others. I mean, we know that I think really part of the story that as we've heard a little bit today, part of the story that we'll tell about day schools in this moment is how quickly they were able to pivot to online learning. So it's not like they had to shut down operations entirely like the JCC system, you know, which had to shut down and lost revenue sort of immediately. Um, the day schools, as you all know, I'm sure, were able to keep operating, but face this immediate challenge of how, you know, parents needing to re-enroll for next year and not knowing immediately, like right now, needing to re-enroll for next year. And many of those families facing unemployment, we, we faced the, one of the things we realized very quickly was the intersecting nature of Jewish communal structures. So people getting laid off from JCCs, like those Jewish communal professionals are probably very likely to be sending their kids to day school. And now they had to decide on whether they were gonna be able to continue to do that for the fall. So. We went through, um, we have been trying to go through national intermediaries on the grants um, because one of the interesting pieces of this um, program is that we're really looking, the funders are really looking at sectors that they may or may not necessarily fund on a day-to-day -day basis. And all of these funders are national funders. So, you know, the question was, how could we get our arms around as much of the Jewish communal infrastructure as possible, as quickly and efficiently as possible? And we decided that one way to do that was to go through national intermediaries. So Prisma has been um, really excellent at understanding the needs of its sector, not just understanding the emergency needs, but also now really starting to think through to this strategic and systemic issues facing the sector. Um, and then each of you, you know, with local focus or particular curricular focus or whatever it is, um, each of you are seeing different pieces of the puzzle that I know a lot of that is being filtered up to Prisma, which is then sharing it with us. So um, I would say that the, um, the, the grant, the, so far the main grant that we've made um, in the day school sector is to tuition assistance, because as I was saying, that was a mo one that made itself immediately known. And I know that Prisma is anticipating, you know, sort of surveying all the schools in its network and, and anticipating at least $15 million. And Paul, you can just correct me if I get anything wrong here, but at least 15 million more dollars, incremental dollars needed in tuition assistance this year across the sector. And as you all know, as funders of the sector, there was already a lot of tuition assistance that was already needed. So we know that there's that, that increased need. And that's what we decided, the JCRF funders decided immediately to fund. And now um, we'll start thinking through and hopefully filtering out to the field and Prisma will hopefully filter out to the field um, many of the other kinds of systemic issues that are, that are um, popping up in schools, some of which have come up already, like how do you teach teachers to deliver content online um, we haven't yet mentioned mental health, but of course there's going to be a, a real crisis. Kids and families and teachers and administrators are going through a lot right now and we'll have to think about how schools address that. Um, 
two other pieces that I just wanted to bring up because we're seeing them not just in day schools, but across different sectors. One is about collaboration and partnerships. I think that the impact of everything shutting down all at once um, and all sources of revenue having question marks um, on them has really, I think, led to an unprecedented amount, an unprecedented amount of collaboration within sectors, so school to school, funder to funder, and also across sectors, day schools and camps, day schools and JCCs. And I think you know, the more we can, as funders, try to foster those kinds of collaborations moving forward, the better off not just the school universe will be, but the, sec the communal infrastructure as a whole. And the other piece that I want to, I don't know that much about this in terms of day schools, but I just wanted to raise it because I know it's on Prisma's mind and it's also on the minds of other sectors, is this question of how you rethink your curriculum and your program even, if now people have access basically to anything, you know, online um, that they could want. So what does it mean, you know, it used to be that everyone walked into a school and the school developed its own thing, possibly in partnership with others, and you were limited by who your teacher was in the classroom. If now you can do anything you want with any teacher online at all, it really, I think, you know, on the one hand, you could see that as a threat. On the other hand, I think you could see it as an incredible opportunity um, to build out curriculum with the best minds you know, in education and day school education and Jewish education um, around the world. I think we see even on this call, like Anne was saying at the beginning, anyone can be here. So we've broken open the boundaries, you know, kind of to everything. So how do we, how do we take the best advantage of that? I'm gonna stop, I'm happy to answer more questions um, and uh, just thank you all really for your continued investment in the day school. Universe. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, we're going to open up for questions now. Um, just to get us going, I'm going to ask one or two openers and then really throw it, throw it, out, throw it out to everyone on this call. So um, uh, I would um, encourage you to uh, just think of the questions that you want to ask. We've had, in fact, I'm going to start off by answering a question rather than asking one, if you'll forgive me, because someone has asked a question about uh, the emergency tuition assistance for this year um, and um, and the way we have approached that and actually I will I will, I will answer it and then uh, and then um, segue that into a question because it's one of the things that was on my mind as questions part of the question is what happens if you give one year of tuition assistance and um, what about the rest of the years um, and I think it, it really hits up against the question that we're all struggling with at the moment which is to what extent is it our duty to give now and to give immediately to um, ameliorate the emergency that we face? And what does it mean to be strategic when you think about philanthropy? And, and within strategic, I would think about the long term. So, so the, the tuition assistance funding that uh, we have established with the support of um, JCRAF um, is really intended to get to help schools to address the immediate needs that they face right now and to address um, some of the specific issues that come out about the from the uh, economic crunch that the crisis has created. Um, and there are a number of questions that come from it. One is that the hope that by helping schools retain students with immediate funding, then families will be in a better position in months or years ahead. Uh, and in particular that certain areas of the economy where people have suffered will bounce back as the economy stabilizes. Um, and that as well as giving the schools greater time to raise their own funds for future years where that is possible, but it's not possible for everyone. Those are some of the reasons to really focus on the here and now and address the immediate needs that, um, uh, that we face. But the broader question is, but none of us really knows what the world will look like in 12 months time. And that is why not only do we need to think about how to make the funds available for future years, it's also why we need to think about the strategic responses like the one that Anne spoke about, which is to restructure tuition assistance in ways that, um, uh, that do address strategic issues. It's one of the reasons why we, we were delighted to have Anne speaking today is because actually uh, what they created um, for the new school was not something that was around COVID. It was around actually how do you address the structural issues for the long term. So um, 
that, that's the nature of what is happening with this tuition assistance. The question I'd like to ask our speakers is, how do you think about the balance between responding to emergency and the desire to be strategic? I'll open it up to any of you. You don't all have to answer, but anyone who wants to jump in, uh, very much welcome. Any takers? I'll just, I'll just, I'll start. Um, Unless I can. And Connie, you can jump in too. You know, pre, prior, Connie mentioned that we had 450 kids in seven day schools in Seattle. That's a pretty low number for our Jewish population of close to 70,000. Um, it's actually the lowest enrollment across the United States per Jewish population. And so pri at, prior to COVID, we were already grappling with this, that we have seven very small schools. Um, COVID and what can we do for the long term? Because we're at the point where it's really a question of critical mass in the schools, not so much the funding of the, of the schools. Um, you know, if the class size ranges from like four, four students to 13 and a half students, you know, per grade, that's a pretty, it's a pretty scary situation to be in. So when, but then when COVID hit, we had to really respond to the emerge, uh, the needs right now um, of helping our schools respond and they have all responded beautifully and they've really collaborated well with one another. And Paul, you're right about opening up or maybe it was tomorrow some, or Felicia, you talked about opening up the world to the classroom, and we've really seen that here. Um, so I don't really have an answer to this question, but it's one that we are grappling with in Seattle um, at a very high level. I think we had 450 kids before COVID, looking at 420 starting in the fall. Um, so we were doing a strategic yeah. planning process. One of the challenges with that grappling, right, is shortly after coming into this role, we contracted with TCC uh, back in New York, TCC Group, uh, to work with us on strategic planning. Part of that is a day school deep dive. And we're looking at things like alternative tuition models. Um, and Jeremy and Ann are just incredible role models for the entire country in that regard. Um, looking at what we can do to try to address, you know, where can schools come together? Where do they need to be distinct? What's driving the number of schools we have? And then what allows them to be high quality and financially sustainable. And um, they're challenging issues. So then we are also faced, when you have COVID, for us as a foundation, what do we want to keep doing and moving forward on in terms of something like our strategic plan and our day school deep dive, when you feel like the whole world's been turned upside down and you can't ignore the external you know, blow to the side of the ship, so to speak. And I think it's a balancing act. So we're still, we're continuing with our long-term planning, but we're doing it with the recognition that COVID adjusts what some of our short-term goals and outcomes can be. COVID could be an accelerator and somewhat of a motivator for us to be able to move forward and change in ways that people might have been resistant to changing in the past. So I think it goes both sides depending how you use it. Felicia, did you want to jump in on Anne? Anne. I, I just I would just no, go ahead, Anne. No, I just so I saw it's sort of a combination. I saw Melissa asked if um, if we had um, partners in the funding and um, so and, and I think how long is the funding for so number one we don't have partners for the funding but um, I, I think that we would love to have had funders for the um, we would love to have partners and maybe we will in the future and I think partnering is is fantastic to give people a sense of what it's costing us annually um, to do this is it's about three hundred thousand dollars a year and we worked out that number um, with the school based on it was really whatever they were paying um, and then we, we we supplemented it and um, and so if you break it out and, and people who are who are already let, uh, give, uh, paying less than that aren't part of it and the preschool was also not part of uh, the tuition incentive program because Preschools are really expensive anywhere people would go. So we decided that wasn't a, a smart place to invest our money. And, and, the, um, and we did it for five years because we didn't want people, someone was talking about what do you do for next year, one-time assistance, as Paul was saying for these grants, is that um, we wanted people to know that this wasn't just come into the school and then we're going to sock you next year with a huge amount of money. But in fact, that um, if you commit, 
uh, we will commit to you for five years. And we've also told the school that um, if it works and the school grows, we would do it for however long it, uh, because it, that's our goal to grow the school. And truthfully, it gets cheaper. The more people who come in the school, the less expensive it will be for the, for the uh, donors who, who participate um, in this. Felicia. Yeah, I just wanted, I wanted to offer a way of thinking about this. We're starting to think about um, at JCRIF, and I see Daron from Maimonides is on the, on the uh, call, so I wanted to give credit where credit is due. His colleague, Amy Weiss, actually came up with this term of, str of strategic transitionary grants. So if you think about, you know, responding grants that respond to the moment, that help you sort of bridge from now to the future and that have some element of strategy in them, that's I think what, what a lot of us are, are able to do right now is not to make grants that don't at all think about what came before and what we want to happen next, but kind of hold those hold all of these ideas at once, which is really difficult to do. I heard somebody compare COVID to a heart attack. You know, if you have sort of a heart attack, everything stops, right? You need the CPR, like the emergency response to get the patient breathing again. But then you sort of quickly have to, you know, jump into how do we keep the patient healthy in the future? And also what was in the patient's, you know, sort of behavior or health conditions in the past that we now know that we need to change in order to help the patient live longer, not have another heart attack. So we didn't bring this heart attack on ourselves, um, but it definitely gives us an opportunity to think about what we want the future to look like. It's really sort of forced on us in this very unpleasant way. Thank you. I'm just going to bring in Hana just to respond to the question, which is about uh, data across the field about enrollment for the coming year. Thank you. So um, we recently, because we were accepting the uh, applications for the tuition assistance, we received applications from just about 100 schools. And of those 100 schools, uh, the average was about 4% of uh, enrollment reduction that each of the schools was planning and reporting. And so that gave us some information that helped us understand what the field was looking at in, in reality. Um, and of course, those applications are still ongoing, that we're still seeing schools who are making those decisions, who are uh, very much engaged in the, um, in the enrollment process and in the recruitment process. We hope those numbers will change, but right now what we're hearing from the field is that there's a lot of uncertainty from parents. That, um, that is leading to them to be hesitant and to be late in their enrollment and their, um, in their admissions um, processes. And I'm going to uh, give us all a few minutes back and just yeah. take this opportunity to, to thank our speakers, Anne Parva, Connie Cantor, Melissa Rifkin, and Felicia Herman. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. I also want to thank the Jewish Funders Network and thank you to Mark Reidman for your leadership of this and making this possible. Um, I have a thank, a thank you to my colleague, um, Hannah Olson, who really has worked incredibly hard on setting these things, these things up. And of course, the, the art that goes behind weaving who speakers should be and, and how we're going to have a really um, productive conversation like we've had, uh, Hannah has produced all of that. And lastly, I want to thank everyone on this call for being here and for more importantly, for what you do every single day in support of our schools, of our students and of our community. Thank you. Just to wrap up, I'm gonna hand back to Tamar. Yes, thank you. I wanna echo all of your all of your thank yous to Hannah, to you, to, to Anne, Melissa, Connie and Felicia. I appreciate all of you logging on again. We hope to do this again in another few weeks, maybe talk more about how, how the reopening is going and how funders can be helpful. So. Um, look out for that information in the coming weeks in the newsletter and and please please join us. We have three other webinars and virtual meetups like this one going on at JFN just this week. So check out our website and, and join us again for future learning. Thank you all. Have a good day.